Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining MHPA for our weekly webinar Wednesday series. Uh, before we get started with today's webinar, I'd like to remind all of our attendees that today's webinar is in listen-only mode. If you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please make sure that you enter them in the Q&A section located at the right hand of your screen. Our presenters will address all questions at the end of their presentation. I would like to welcome and thank MHPA's Business Associate Member, WellTalk, for leading today's webinar Wednesday. Today's webinar is entitled, Just Add Text, How to Improve Medicaid Member Engagement and Outcomes. Reaching Medicaid beneficiaries is hard, but not impossible. Texting is a high-reach, convenient, and cost-effective way to reach your members. On today's webinar, you will learn from a series of real-world case studies that demonstrate how population health programs, targeted campaigns, and personalized messaging take texting beyond a communication channel to improve health outcomes including 26% increase in well baby visits, 35% fewer missed prenatal visits, 12% reduction in HbA1c, 76% increase in reach rate. You will also learn how a smart mix of consumer data, additional communication channels, and clinically, clinically proven programming can boost results even more. I'd like to welcome today's presenters, Clint Furman, VP Public and Community, uh, well, at WellPath, Anne Marie Gramling, Senior Vice President, Consumer Experience Solutions at WellTalk, and Diana Zuskov, Senior Director of Health Services, Public and Community at WellPath. So, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to today's presenters. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Marie Gramling. I'm the Senior Vice President here at WellTalk, responsible for our Consumer Experience Solutions. Just wanted to start by saying thanks for joining us today. As Nicole mentioned, we're really going to spend the next hour together sharing our approach to leveraging text messaging to improve Medicaid member engagement and outcomes. So I'm looking forward to uh, spending an interesting hour with you guys. Um, you know, I think many of you may have seen in the news that WellPass recently joined the WellTalk family. And I'm sure many of you even know or have worked with them since they're the leading provider of text message-based health services for Medicaid. So I'm really excited to introduce you to the two of them today. We've got uh, our resident experts in-house that are joining us and are going to lead us through a lot of this conversation. So Clint, I'm going to take it over, uh, turn it over to you to actually, oh, I completely lied. I got so excited I jumped ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'm going to actually give you a quick overview of WellTalk so we have a little bit of context to um, make sure that you understand a little bit about who we are. So as we take you through the conversation, ideally you can be uh, referencing back to what we're doing overall. So sorry for the quick start there, but um, you know we're actually a data-driven SaaS company. We're offering a consumer activation platform. That platform really allows our customers to activate their consumers or their members by targeting and connecting them with personalized health resources. Our customers include health plans, employers, providers, public and community space, as well as pharmacy and health services. And our solutions are designed to power your growth and retention initiatives, improve the healthcare value you're providing, and really streamline how the consumer experiences it. So now, <laughs> without further ado, I will actually turn this over to Clint and Diana to share with us how uh, text messaging is being used to improve engagement and outcomes in the Medicaid market. So Clint, I finally am going to kick it over to you. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Amber. You scared me for a second there. I wasn't uh, good. There you go. Uh, well, thanks so much. And, and just to recap a little bit of what Amber said and set the context for our conversation today. Uh, what we're going to be talking about are the challenges of member communication and engagement and activation, uh, a comprehensive approach to attacking those challenges, and more specifically, how text messaging can be used as an effective tool uh, for communication and engagement, uh, given those challenges we're trying to overcome. I think everyone here is familiar with uh, what we're detailing on this slide. I know we're preaching to the choir a little bit, but just to run through this from our perspective, what we're hearing from our clients and seeing in the market is pretty consistent with regard to the challenges that you all face and we all collectively face in engaging this population. From a health plan perspective, the data that you receive and the information that you receive about members from your states is so often fragmented and outdated. 
Uh, we heard some statistics at the MHPA conference a couple of weeks ago from the Institute for Medicaid Innovation that based on their surveys, around 65% of data that plans are receiving from the states uh, is either incomplete or inaccurate. Uh, makes sense when you understand the population and the chain of, of possession that this data travels through from an eligibility agency to a sometimes an enrollment broker to the MMIS uh, and all the way over to you all. So right at the outset, you've got missing information and an incomplete view of the members that you're trying to serve. And then you've got high member churn. Um, you know, these folks, oftentimes uh, you don't have them for very long, don't have the ability to build long <clears throat> relationships with them. And, you know, against that backdrop, you've got state requirements that increasingly are more stringent uh, and states and their contracts asking us to do more and more in terms of quick follow-up and treatment and getting people to the care that they need. Uh, and then so often we're not coordinating uh, these communication and engagement efforts across the spectrum. Uh, they're not member-centric. We're each tackling our own use cases and don't really have good visibility over everything that we're sending to members, the ways in which we're trying to communicate with them and the effectiveness of those efforts. And then from a member perspective, I think we're all familiar with this. This is oftentimes a transient population. Uh, you've got folks who are moving frequently. Direct mail often doesn't make its way to them. They're working multiple part-time jobs in some populations and in some states. Um, it's hard for folks to answer the phone or to get in touch with their healthcare resources. And again, because many of our efforts aren't really member-centric, <clears throat> we get a confused landscape of communications and efforts going out to members, we don't always make it as easy as we could to communicate with the various parties uh, in the healthcare landscape. They've got the Medicaid agency that's trying to reach them, the eligibility folks, as well as their health plan, their provider, it's, it's overwhelming at times. And so moving to the next slide, what we're going to talk about today is a, a little bit of a different approach uh, to how to tackle these challenges, a more comprehensive and holistic approach to that communication, engagement, and activation. And I use those three words deliberately, very specifically. Oftentimes we, we can uh, be redundant with them and say, well, communication is the same as, as engagement. It's really not. If you think about what you do from a plan perspective and what we're trying to achieve, there are very unique and distinct things we're trying to accomplish at, at each of those levels uh, of engagement and communication. And if we take a look at the building blocks to the left here, we think this is the right approach to tackle this, really getting a holistic view of the member <clears throat> and taking a holistic approach to trying to reach them and engage them. And it starts with just knowing more about your members and your population, utilizing consumer data, uh, external assets beyond just claims and clinical data to begin to build a better picture of them, social determinants of health, demographic data that help to paint a full picture of who this person is and who this family is that we're trying to reach and engage with, what their circumstances are, can start with just better phone information and address information and go all the way up to some attributes that Anne-Marie will talk about in a moment. And then using analytics uh, based on that information to really begin to build a targeted profile of who that individual is. We're, we're all familiar with how analytics can be used effectively for uh, <clears throat> risk assessment and all of those things. What we're talking about here is a little bit different. We're talking about who's going to be most receptive in a population to certain types of communication. How do we get the right message to the right channel at the right time to the right person? And then the targeted multi-channel communications to be able to do that, not just using text, not just using IVR, not just using direct mail, but being able to target those communications through the channel that makes the most sense. And then finally, wrapping that all up with personalized rewards and incentives used appropriately uh, with the right programs and with the right activities to try and incent folks to get that activation level and take the steps that we're, we're asking them to take and that they need to take to, to improve their health. Pulling that all together into a comprehensive approach that both Anne Marie and Diana will be talking about. Many folks in the market have one or all of these pieces, uh, but they're oftentimes not together and coordinated in a comprehensive and holistic way. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So with that, Anne Marie, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks, Clint. I got a little echo. Sorry, guys. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how to understand your population and what are some of the tools and, and um, elements that we can help with. And, you know, it, we all talk in, about personalization. It's a big buzzword. It's used all over the place. And we all know 
that it matters when it comes to getting someone to take the right action or really start to change a behavior. Retail companies like Amazon have really mastered the art of showing us personalized recommendations and getting us to buy that one more thing that we really don't need. It was me this morning. I won't tell you what it was, but I didn't really need it. But they're so good at it that we've all come to actually expect personalized experiences. We expect that the person that's trying to reach us really understands something about us. And we know that everyone responds a little differently to information based on what's going on in their lives at that moment, right, that particular moment in time. So what resonates with me today will very likely change tomorrow if it turns out that I find out I'm going to be a grandma for the first time or I realize I need to take care of a sick parent. Um, you know, all those things start to change our perspective and allow us to have a message resonate or not. So it really comes down to the data that you have and you know about someone that allows you to start to personalize your communications so that you can connect with your members at the right time, using the right channel, leveraging the right voice, and really working the right message so that you can connect with them. So the big challenge though really is how do you personalize to drive better outcomes when you're really often limiting with um, dealing with limited data. So I hear this all the time. I have been working with clients in this space for the better part of 10 years. And what we've found is really, you know, stats show us that 77% of MCOs today say that difficulty reaching their members is actually the biggest barrier to completing individual health risk assessments. Right? And you need that information to determine which members are at high risk, what the best programming is to offer to them. 85% are actually saying they have difficulty contacting their members. And this, I'm sure, there's no surprise to you guys, right? But it is one of the biggest barriers in being able to provide effective high-risk case management. And then you add in the fact that the churn rate is so high in this market, right? You really have maybe at best on average 10 months with this person before they move on and then they turn through the cycle again. So the data is really challenging to be able to get to understand them and then be able to turn around and use that really, really quickly. So let's switch gears a little bit and we'll talk a little bit how, about how adding consumer data can really start to provide you with some unparalleled insight into your population. So if you start, if we're going to start on the left-hand side, I'll show you what you typically have as traditional data sets available to you, right? Claims information, medical records, all of that conventional data that plans typically have. But in reality, it really only provides you insight into about 10% of that person, which is why we're looking at uh, our friend Maria from the knees down over here. But um, um, when we start to add that information in, that consumer data, that starts to clear up the picture of who Maria is because really 90% of the information about who we all are is based on our consumer data. So when I start to look at adding that information in, I get to supplement your information with consumer data. Now I'm going to walk you through this. What you see, it's really three different sections when I talk about consumer data. This first light blue bar is all of the proprietary consumer data that we have available to us that help us really start to understand a population. But then as we move slightly to the right, we also are collecting information directly from your members. We have a tendency to talk about them as consumers, but these are really your members. What are they interested in doing? What are they motivated by doing? And then finally, this is the two-way dialogue. We're actually tracking of the things we ask them to do, who did it, who completed it, and even more importantly, who didn't. So just as much as what we understand about what someone did, what they didn't do tells us a lot as well. And we're really feeding all of that information back in to our databases to understand them and continually learn. So I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the proprietary data that we have available to us and how we're using that to impact targeting and engagement. 
we've actually got over 800 consumer data variables. They are all individually identifiable, and we have that on over 275 million Americans. We're actually able to use that data to analyze a wide array of determinants that impact an individual's health status. Specifically, it's things like, do they have an online presence? Are they active on social media? Um, this has a tendency to freak people out when I say it, so I will just explain. We're not actually tracking what you're saying and what you're posting. We just know that you're online or not, and we understand how active you are. It doesn't go any further than that, I promise. Um, we, ha we have an understanding of income and tax status, of someone's household and, and family makeup. Do they have small children? Are they caring for parents? Um, and one of the biggest insights actually comes from understanding how often someone votes. So the fact that we're right in the middle of the election season, I thought you, might, you guys might be interested to know that individuals that regularly vote in interim elections tend to be more adherent to medication and treatment plans. So you can start to use some of this information to inform how you want to approach folks. And those same individuals are also less likely to disenroll from their health plans than their non-voting counterparts. And finally, those people who have a history of voting but then ultimately stop for one reason or another turn out to be at higher risk for hospitalization. So when you start to be able to understand who the population is through this consumer data set, you're able to actually do a lot more. Even though you might have some limited claims and, and typical medical information, this consumer data becomes incredibly powerful for how you communicate with your populations. And then we're able to apply all of that information through machine learning and really start to help you understand your population a little more clearly we can start to predict who has what kinds of needs through this information. We're also able to then look at who's most likely to be impactable, meaning of the various things that you need to get them to do, who's most likely to participate in some of these programs, really become active. And then ideally, we can predict for you which channels we're most apt to contact them through. So all of that helps us provide a personalized experience. We're able to get to Maria in a specific way for things that are relevant to her through channels that she's most likely to engage with. So when you're able to leverage that data and use a data-driven approach, your results often, oh, sorry, when, you're, when you aren't able to do that, Clearly, I need a little more caffeine today, guys. Um, this is what it starts to look like, and this is going to feel really familiar to a lot of you, I think. The folks in orange, our little orange people here, represent those folks that are receptive to a message and really likely to take action. The folks in blue, typically you're not going to be able to reach them. They're the folks that don't do anything as hard as you try. But when you don't have that information about them, what ends up happening is you spend your time and effort and you really hit sort of this peanut butter approach to communicating and trying to get people to take action. And you apply the time and the money and the resources you have across as many people as you can, typically up to that point where you hit your limits, which is represented by that gray bar in the middle. So even though you had people that were receptive, you weren't able to get to them because you ran out of time or resources. So you really have a missed opportunity in be, being able to connect with some of those folks. They're the ones that would have engaged, but you just couldn't get to them. But when you're able to combine that with the analytics and you have the ability to layer in a multi-channel approach to your outreach, you're actually able to apply your time and your money to engaging those parts of the population that are receptive to your programming and actually start to drive them through the right channels and actually now you're maximizing your spend and you're maximizing the outreach and the outcomes that you're able to drive. Because you're talking to the folks that are much more likely to engage and doing it through the channels that they are much more likely to actually pick up and take that action through. So think of this as sort of the spend optimization because you're able to say, I'm gonna go after these folks. They're the ones that are targeting and receptive 
And these are the channels that I know they are going to outreach or they are going to respond to best. It seems really easy, but unless you have the data, that's a really big challenge to unlock. And then lastly, this is, again, something that I think is probably really familiar to you guys. This is typically, this top half of the slide, this is typically what all of our clients are going through and what's really happening to their members. You've got lots of different folks across your organizations, typically with competing agendas on topics that are really important that they communicate about, but they're not coordinated, right? Your, your different groups across your organizations are not lining up and say, well, I need to talk about gaps in, here, in care here. I want to make sure I'm directing folks to the right resources for family care and nutrition. But because they're not coordinated, we're bombarding people. And what ends up happening is we aggravate people, they start to tune out, the true important messages get lost because one size does not fit all. But as we start to move into tools and data and a platform that truly can help coordinate those efforts, you end up moving into an optimized experience. You leverage that data to understand who they are. You're able to coordinate that communication approach so that you're doing the most important things. You're talking to the folks that are most likely to participate in those activities and drive those behaviors, which ultimately ends up giving you better satisfaction with your members and higher value on your investment. And it starts to build that relationship because you are creating a personalized experience. You're talking to these members in a way that feels like what they told you they wanted or how you know that they'll respond. So, Clint, I think it's probably a great time for you to start to share your experience with the group about just how important the messaging is in engaging this population. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. And, and we are going to shift now and talk specifically about text messaging uh, as a component of this holistic approach that we're talking about. And, specifically about the effectiveness uh, of text messaging and the appropriateness for the Medicaid population. There's really been an evolution uh, over the last decade, if you think about text messaging and its uh, use in healthcare. Ten years ago, there were a lot of questions about you know, whether Medicaid populations had phones and the ability to text message. What was the penetration rate? Uh, was this something that was going to be effective in this population? I think, you know, we now know, and we'll speak to these statistics in a moment, that this is not only something that's prevalent, but you know, very much in use of the population and probably the most effective form of communication. Um, health plans have certainly deployed text messaging, and we've deployed it in other parts of uh, the healthcare landscape, but have not yet utilized it to its full extent. And most plans are just now beginning to think about how to uh, push this out and deploy it as a full form of communication and really as, an, uh, as a new approach uh, to member communication and engagement. So from an effectiveness standpoint, the statistics that you see here on the screen are just a handful that we pulled, but they do speak to how, how much this form of communication can be effective in this population. We know that 90% of text messages, for example, are read within three minutes of the time that they're received. Doesn't always mean that we respond within three minutes. I know I certainly don't, much to my mom's chagrin, uh, but we do read them when they come in. Low-income American, low Americans send twice as many texts per day compared to those with higher incomes. It's an interesting statistic that I know for me took a little bit of thinking through, but if you think about how folks in this population communicate, they don't have laptops, uh, they don't have access to Wi-Fi in many cases, and so that phone becomes the primary form of communication for them uh, as they go about their day. And greater than 60% of low-income Americans have used their phone to access health information. They're building off that point, when they do need to try and connect and, and get access to care and get information, that phone is the primary tool that they're utilizing. So from an efficacy perspective, uh, both in the general population and in the Medicaid population, I think text messaging has proven to be a very effective and, and uh, ubiquitous form of communication. The next slide starts to get into the appropriateness of text messaging for this population. <clears throat> and talking about that evolution even more so than the, the use of text messaging, our thought process around the regulatory landscape and is this an appropriate uh, channel has really changed in the last few years. Uh, I served in, at the Agency for Healthcare Administration in Florida back in the early 2000s, which is Florida's Medicaid agency. 
And I can remember going and watching American Idol and seeing, you know, text in your vote to this number and coming back in and us brainstorming about wouldn't it be cool if we could utilize this form of communication. Uh, and at that time, our general counsel came back and said, hey, look, there's, there's too many barriers here. This is going to be too tough to implement. Fast forward now, you know, a decade uh, or a little more, and we've really begun to break down some of these perceived barriers and overcome them uh, and, you know, have made this available as a broad-based form of communication. Starting with TCPA compliance, the, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act has always been one, and you know, rightfully so, that we look at and say, can we do this? We're now able to uh, broadly use text messaging in the Medicaid population with health plans and be fully compliant with the TCPA. A big part of that is prior consent, and do you have a consent to text message your members? Uh, and the majority of states and the majority of plans nationally, even some of the largest and most conservative plans uh, now agree that prior express consent to text exists uh, when the person supplies their cell phone number as part of the eligibility process or the application process or when they voluntarily supply it to uh, the plan or provider. So you've got that consent to initiate texting to members. <clears throat> and then by utilizing our tools uh, that allow us to do this, I want people to opt out. Uh, on their own timing and out of the messaging that they don't want to receive. Being able to say at the outset of messaging, you have the right to say stop. You can discontinue this messaging right away. Um, if you want to continue to receive messages about your health care, you know, uh, let us know. You can also target that to specific programs and campaigns and types of messages. So you, you don't have to use a one-size-fits-all approach to allow people to opt out or opt in. Certainly there are a variety of perspectives on this. Um, among some states and some plans, but at this point, it's a we see in our client base a fairly broad acceptance of of uh, allowing this as a channel. And lastly, that cost and members concern that oftentimes has been an issue in the past really gets overcome by that opt out capability because um, at this point now you have the opportunity to say no, I don't want to continue receiving these messages. Um, many folks now have uh, all you can eat text messaging plans, and that has reduced the ubiquity of those plans, has reduced some of this concern, but either way, being able to opt out um, reduces it completely. And so we think now if you look at text messaging as an approach, uh, those barriers are mainly overcome. We've gotten to a point where we're ready to use text messaging as a broad-based form of communication and engagement. And the thing that we're going to talk about now, and then I'll shift to Diana to, to talk in more detail about is thinking about text messaging not just as a binary communication tool, not just sending out a text uh, and letting people know about something, but building a holistic member-centric approach that starts with the time that you first see a member and their family all the way to the time that it's, it's time for redetermination, building a continuous conversation and using text messaging not just as a technology or as a tool, but really as a, as a holistic approach to what we're trying to accomplish. And so with that, Diana, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so, so the way that we think about this, just as Clint mentioned, is not just uh, adding this channel, um, but really taking this really ubiquitous and, and very effective channel and combining it with health interventions um, to make what we refer to as health messaging, um, which is really text messaging that's designed to improve your quality and clinical and, and business goals. Um, and we kind of think about this in a three-tier approach, and we're going to also review some case studies for each of these tiers just to help you um, understand how it really comes to life. So if you look at the slide here, we've got an upside-down pyramid. And at the top of that pyramid, we've got the broad base. Um, and that is really what we refer to as our population health program. Those are um, evidence-based programs that take a proven health education or, or disease management curriculum um, and really space it out into an ongoing dialogue to form that relationship and check in with members around their wellness and condition management, um, providing that health promotion and education um, and that proactive support to say, don't forget you're going to need a flu shot this year um, and this is where you can get one and this is why it's important to get one. Um, and so these programs are truly disease management interventions. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how they've been developed with content partners and have had clinically validated outcomes later in, in the webinar. Um, but, but those really form, again, the high reach, sort of broad base of the approach. In the middle of the pyramid here, we have 
uh, the flexible targeted campaign layer. And so this is the layer that really helps drive your business goals. For many health plans, uh, that can mean um, targeted alerts. Um, and so for most of our client base, they really use this campaign layer to address gaps in care. Um, but it can also really support some of the um, contractual measures outside of quality. So if you think about sending someone a, a campaign to let them know that as a new member, they need to complete a health risk assessment. And even starting to tease some of those questions in the health risk assessment through the interactive text messages. Um, because someone may not want to spend, you know, 30 minutes on the phone answering all of these questions, but answering three or four quickly through an interactive text message can still uh, help get, get that data and relationship with the member. Um, and then lastly, on the tip of the pyramid here, we've got what we consider more of the individual level. Uh, so person-to-person -person messaging is the ability to use um, a, a platform um, for HIPAA compliant and secure text messaging and secure messaging that your care and case managers can use to outreach to individuals one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in small groups to help condition management, um, and just general care coordination. We'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides here about what that really looks like and the outcomes that we've seen uh, as a result of that. So if we go on to the next slide here, um, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about these population health programs. And the way that I really think about these is taking an evidence-based curriculum um, that some of the leading content experts have worked on. So you can see here, there's uh, logos from a number of agencies that many of you are familiar with. And if you think about the American Academy of Pediatrics coming out with the Bright Futures Guidelines and telling pediatricians, these are the 15 things that you need to be checking in with each of your pediatric patients. We've taken those guidelines and then transformed those into a week-by-week, day-by-day set of text messages. So that instead of waiting for the Medicaid mom to take their kid in for their wellness check, and then having the pediatrician ask them a whole host of questions about, are you using a car seat? You know, are you meeting these developmental milestones? We've actually kind of you know, expanded that out beyond the visit. And so that mom can have a whole series of text messages, a couple a week or, um, to really learn about what should I be expecting for my five-year-old? You know, what are some of the games and um, inter activities that we should be working on? What are some of the healthy behaviors I should be teaching her about? And what can I expect at my upcoming visit? Um, and that works similarly for both the wellness programs and then, of course, the condition management programs like diabetes, smoking cessation, and maternal health. So we're going to start out by looking at actually a case study of one of these programs um, and one that may be familiar to many of you on the call, which is the Text for Baby program, uh, which is specific to maternal and infant health. So as many of you know, um, you know, prenatal care is absolutely critical to healthy birth outcomes and to reducing the cost of those births. Um, but as a Medicaid plan, I'm sure you're all familiar with how difficult it is. You know, you only have a few months to really engage with the mom, um, form that relationship, connect them to a provider, make sure that they go to all the prenatal visits. Um, and then, of course, once they have the baby, make sure that both mom is getting their postpartum visits and the babies are getting their infant well visits. And so that's quite a lot of information to try to translate out into, um, you know, a young mom who's balancing uh, a new baby, probably some other kids, um, and, and a part-time job. And so Text for Baby really tries to take that concept of, you know, what to expect when you're expecting, but instead of waiting for mom to read that and, and really have the time to sit down and digest all that information, really takes it down into bite-sized chunks um, of a, a year-long um, couple messages a week program. And so if we go on to the next slide, we'll see that um, Text for Baby is actually one of the oldest um, and largest mobile health programs in the country. And so over eight years, uh, we've done about 15 peer-reviewed studies that have shown um, significant impact on prenatal appointments and immunization. And so you can see here, participants had 35% fewer prenatal appointments, two times increase in flu shot utilization, and of course, improvements in that parenting preparedness and prenatal care knowledge, being able to know what to expect with their pregnancy. Um, and so it's a great example of how text messaging can really support a short-term outcome uh, like pregnancy. 
Um, but, you know, we also kind of took the same model and applied it to something that's more ongoing, uh, such as diabetes. And so the next case study we wanted to share was actually our Care for Life program that's developed with the American Diabetes Association. And um, as many of you know, again, over half of Medicaid members have uncontrolled diabetes. And, you know, I talk to clients all the time who are really focused on that comprehensive diabetes care measure and really thinking about how do I impact the HEDA scores around that. Um, but the, the truth of it is diabetes complications and hospitalizations, they really often start at home with, you know, diet, exercise, medication adherence. And those daily self-management activities are really critical to maintaining uh, A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, all of those things that you're held accountable for as a health plan. Um, so it's just, it's just not as simple for diabetes as telling a member, you know, you have a gap in care. We really have to approach it in more of a comprehensive life, lifestyle change um, and really find tools that can support the member. And so text messaging is really um, exciting in that it can really push out that information, really engage the member on a daily basis. So we worked with the American Diabetes Association to take the curriculum that they typically send out in a series of mailed pamphlets and really think about how do we translate this into you know, an ongoing relationship, provide members you know, a daily check-in about their blood glucose, reminders to uh, take their medications, and then also set some goals. You know, how many days last week did you take your medication? Great, let's see if we can increase that by one day next week um, and really make it a tailored and, and personalized experience. And so, um, so as you can see in a study funded by PCORI, um, in a study of Medicaid and Medicare covered uh, minority adults with type two diabetes, we saw a very significant reduction in A1C levels. Um, 1.3 reduction, 1.3 point re reduction from an average of 10 and a half, uh, which is about a 12% reduction. And there's a lot of percentages in there, but I think the, the key thing to think about, um, and a, a clinician on the study really helped put this in context, she said that that type of reduction is what you would typically see when you um, add another antihyperglycemic medication into someone's regimen. So as simple as, you know, just a couple of text messages a week can have that very, very significant impact on A1C. And then, of course, you know, with that impact on A1C also comes improvements in medication adherence, reduced hospitalization, and um, adherence to some of the clinical and wellness goals like blood pressure and cholesterol management. So we also wanted to take a moment to look at, again, uh, now that we've looked at two clinical examples, also wanted to share some examples of member engagement and administrative um, use cases. So as many of, you, many of you know, Medicaid members have to redetermine um, and make, in order to maintain their eligibility every year. And of course, that might look a little bit different in each state, but in, in most places, the state sends a set of paperwork to the member's house. Um, and again, that may be an accurate address, it may not be. Um, and so that member then has to you know, find that paperwork, complete it, send it back to the state, uh, all to continue maintaining coverage. Um, and knowing that, you know, those, that addresses are usually out of date and also, honestly, who is gonna open all of that mail and finish the, the paperwork on time, sometimes feels like churn is almost inevitable in this case. And so we partnered with a health plan, um, about a medium-sized health plan in the Midwest to look at their redetermination rates and see if we could really use text messages to do just some simple education on what the renewal process is and whether or not they needed to mail that paperwork back to the state. Um, so this plan was already doing a number of uh, outreaches and communications. And so we really wanted to see would adding text message help you know get people over that last hurdle and the answer was yes um, so after adding text messaging to their existing outreach um, they saw a two percent increase in successful redetermination that translated to about four thousand members maintaining coverage per year uh, which for a plan of that size is about a million dollars in cost savings just from not having to have members come on and off the plan and uh, not having to you know, worry about the administrative costs uh, associated with that term. So last but not least, uh, we also wanted to come back to that um, use case of person-to-person -person manage 
messaging, which again, if you think back to the slide a few minutes ago, was at the tip of that pyramid. Um, and I'm sure many of you have colleagues who work in care management or in outreach who spend most of their day trying to get a hold of members. Um, we heard, again, at the MHPA conference last week, um, some of the survey that was presented that 85% of health plans said that the biggest barrier to, their, to care coordination was simply getting in touch with members. Um, and so texting is really unique and effective at getting in touch with people. As Clint mentioned earlier, you know, you can get a text and, and read it and respond immediately. Um, or if it's not a convenient time, you can also respond later. And so you can really meet people, um, you know, where they are, when they are available. And so we worked um, with a, a group of care managers uh, who implemented um, texting, one-on-one -on -one messaging um, for their chronic disease population, and also added some automated messaging around appointment reminders and medication reminders uh, to help really scale the care management experience. And so this population added one-to-one um, -one messaging um, into their standard phone-based care management and then looked at both the experience of the care managers and the experience of the patients. And immediately they saw uh, care managers were saying they had a 10% increase in their success rates of being able to get in touch with their patients. And of course, that then translates to more effective care coordination. And you can see an increase in appointment attendance and prescription refills as well. So now that, just to recap, I know that was quite a lot of information. We talked about the population health programs impacting some of the clinical use cases of maternity and diabetes. We then looked at the, the targeted campaign um, to really impact the redetermination and administrative examples. Um, and then, of course, here are the care coordination through that one-on-one -on -one messaging. Um, I wanted to turn it back over to Anne Marie to also talk a little bit more about how those different types of text messaging can also be combined with other channels for maximum impact. Great, thanks Diana. So I'll share one last data point with all of you around how we were actually able to help a regional health plan target and communicate with some of their hardest to reach Medicaid members that were struggling with asthma and, um, and or diabetes, but in many cases both. And the plan really wanted to ensure that the members received information about how to manage their conditions and, and how to help them feel better on a regular basis because they would put them in control with some education. So we put together a multi-channel campaign that included three communications to an initial population of about 20, almost 22,000 Medicaid members. And actually, the program really successfully reached these members quickly and effectively. It drove sustained engagement and ultimately increased their loyalty, retention, but most importantly, the healthy behaviors. So through this multi-touch and multi-channel, we were actually able to reach, meaning connect to them, either leave them a message or get to them directly, 76% of those almost 22,000 really hard to reach members. That's a really great lift. We don't typically see something that high, but this worked exceptionally well. Um, of those 76 folks that we were, sorry, 76% that we were able to reach, 11% of them enrolled in their Medicaid, um, in their weekly SMS text programming. So we put together a program, we educated them about what was coming, offered to enroll them in this program, the program was scheduled to last for a year. They were going to get a text message every single week for a year. My favorite part of all of the stats here, of those folks that enrolled, 80% of them remained enrolled throughout the entire 52-week program. So that's a, that's a really big number. Not only did they enroll, they actually, as, as Diana and Clint have alluded to, text messaging itself has been so incredibly effective. These guys stayed enrolled for the entire program. And they all learned how to, whoops, sorry guys, I bumped way ahead again. Um, they all learned how to better control and manage their, their conditions. They led to healthier behaviors. They saw increases in, or sorry, reductions in some of the uh, emergency room visits and other complications that typically come along with this. So again, um, we have added a lot of information. We've shared quite a bit over the last 45 minutes or so. Um, but if I, if I had to summarize it, I'd want to make sure that the takeaway for you all 
is really to think about the lessons learned that you heard throughout the different uh, data points that we shared, right? Number one, your data set typically is a little bit limited. It's hard. This is a, this is a more transient population. They move around a lot. Their contact information changes really frequently. Leveraging consumer data is going to be a really big win for all of you in getting to understand your population quickly. Um, meeting them where they are, you heard that earlier today, being able to connect through the most effective channels to actually connect with all of them. Being able to provide valuable, clinical-based, relevant resources, talking to them about the things that matter to them and what's important to them based on what's happening with them at that moment. And then finally, being able to drive engagement with a personalized and rewarding experience. So all of those things, really, that's, what, that's the message we're trying to get across. These four things, if nothing else, remember that that's what you heard about and come back and feel free to talk to us at any point. Um, we love to hear from you guys. You see that uh, our email addresses are up there. We would love to answer any questions you might have as follow-up as part of this. Um, but ideally, we've left you know, the last 10 minutes here so that we can really answer any questions you may have asked throughout the session. So I think Nicole is going to moderate for us at this point, and hopefully we can answer a few now. But also, again, we are avail available to talk to you all about this as often as you would like. Okay, great. Um... Thank you all so much for today's presentation. There have been a few questions that have come through um, over the course of the last 50 minutes. Uh, one of the questions being, for the redetermination messages, have any states with whom you have worked that have viewed these as marketing and therefore not permitted? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, this is Clint, I'll take that one. They, they have not, uh, certainly, you know, there are prohibitions against marketing and it's really about the content of the message. Um, in the Medicaid world, you know, redetermination messages uh, are viewed as, I think, a service related to the Medicaid eligibility and not as marketing. So you have to be careful with the way those are worded. You certainly can't overtly uh, sort of focus them on, you know, retention, but guiding people back to the, the state's eligibility site, including a hyperlink, you know, in the message that takes them back to that site, encouraging them uh, with frequent reminders that their eligibility is coming up and they need to uh, take the steps necessary to maintain their eligibility. We've not run into any problems with that so far. Okay, great. Um, another question. Um, for texts related to sensitive conditions such as behavioral health, are you finding that states and plans are requiring the recipient of the message to opt in to receiving message as opposed to it being perceived as implied consent by virtual effect that it looks like maybe it got a little cough. Um, yeah. Okay. No, that it makes a great question and understand it. Um, so two, two things there. One, no, it's not a matter of, you know, opting in because of the nature of the question. Now, the states have not yet gone that route. Some plans have approached various campaigns and programs a little differently depending on the nature of those things, whether they include something that might be considered PHI, for example, or something that's more sensitive. At times, they will ask for specific opt-in to a program or a campaign versus their more general uh, approach. That's one of the great benefits of the, of the approach that we just talked about is that ability to be very flexible with the programs and messaging you're sending. What's, what's probably more pertinent to that question is if you start dealing with um, messages that do contain uh, PHI, and it's clear that they're PHI test results, for example, there, are, there, are the, there is the option of using secure messaging. We didn't touch on it very much in this presentation, uh, but you want to make sure that the platform you use and the solution you use has the ability to quickly and easily switch back and forth between true SMS and uh, secure messaging where the member would have to download an app or go to a website and authenticate in to receive those results. And this type of approach makes that very easy to have both secure messaging and SMS messaging in the same uh, types of, of streams and campaigns. Great. Um, next question. How do you obtain the member's permission for text messaging? Some of these members may have limited text. 
Yeah, going back to something we talked about uh, earlier in the presentation, the, it's widely accepted now, even some of the last holdouts have come around to this point of view, that you have prior express consent to message these members by virtue of the fact that they've provided their cell phone number as part of an eligibility process or application process or voluntarily submitted it, provided it to the plan. You have the ability under the law via prior express consent to initiate messaging. Uh, from a cost perspective, again, that very first message that goes out uh, gives the member the opportunity to stop all messaging or stop certain kinds of messaging. So immediately they have the opportunity to, um, you know, tell you that they don't want to receive um, communications through this channel. As Anne Marie pointed out, obviously, you know, the ideal situation is to have multiple channels to be able to, uh, to communicate with these folks through. Um, from a cost perspective, you know, we are, we've been very successful in deploying this and using the opt-out as the opportunity to prevent any cost considerations. Okay. Um, how do you manage the challenge of bad phone numbers, et cetera, with texting? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I can speak to how WellTalk does it. Certainly others, uh, you know, have their approaches in the market. but. Uh, we're able to use services that validate the phone number. I think there's a question perhaps uh, right after this that uh, tracks to the same general point. We're able to discern landlines versus mobile numbers. We use a third-party service to do that. It tells us, you know, which of those numbers are valid and available uh, to receive texts, uh, which are, you know, active uh, landlines, and any phone numbers in that file that's given to us that are not valid phone numbers. Okay, great. Um, so um, I know that you addressed the next question in that last answer, but um, another question, you mentioned the barriers to implementing a text campaign. Did the other NCOs secure state approval, buy-in, et cetera, before your launch? They do, and it's a, it's a critical piece of all of this. Um, it's not so much in most states. There are some holdouts. California, for example, we know DHCS there is still getting their arms around how they want to, uh, to prescribe the use of text messaging. There's been some progress, but I'm not sure they've, they've fully joined the deep end of the pool yet. Uh, but in most states, it's not the use of text messaging that they're looking at approving. It is the messages themselves uh, for pre-built messaging, such as the programs that Diana described or campaigns. Almost every state wants to see the content of those messages and approve them before, they, uh, before they're able to be sent out. The exception to that is the person-to-person -person messaging because you know, it's no different than a phone call uh, between a care or case manager uh, and the, the member um, in terms of the, the content and substance of that. But for most pre-built messaging that would get deployed, states uh, do want to see it and do want to approve it. Okay, great, Clint. Um, I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, what should I look for when evaluating and selecting a messaging solution? Yeah, I, I think, and I'll, I'll let Diana speak to this as well, but I think the things you want to look for are the comprehensiveness of the approach. There are an infinite number of services out there that will allow you to send a text message. Uh, your CRM system will allow you, in many cases, to send a binary text message. It really gets down to what your use case is and what you're trying to do. If all you want to do is send a one-time message out to alert people to something and you don't want interactive responses, you don't want branching logic that uh, allows you to tailor additional messaging based on how the member responds, then those types of very commoditized binary services might be appropriate. If you're really looking for something that can embed uh, as a key piece of your overall communication and engagement strategy, and what you really want to be able to do is find something that's flexible. It's not just a set of pre-built campaigns that are not customizable that you kind of have to work your way around. Uh, it allows you to quickly and rapidly deploy messaging that's customized to you. Uh, and it also gives you that ability to attack the, the three layers of the inverted pyramid that Diana showed. What are those campaigns and programs that have clinical validation that can run in the background and support members at a high level, what are those things you need to do to target specific cohorts? And then what about use of text messaging for one-to-one -one communication? To the greatest extent possible from our perspective, those, those are the key pieces that you want to try and be able to, uh, to put in place. Diane, I don't know if you had anything to, to add to that. 
the last thing I would add is just, you know, as Clint said, you can do a lot of different things with help with text messaging. I think if you're really looking to impact quality measures and health improvement, then, you know, I would also look for um, a text messaging service that really has evidence-based um, messaging behind it. You know, it's, text messaging is like any other channel. It's all about the content and how engaging that content is and how appropriate that content is and whether that content is going out to the right person at the right time. Um, and that, you know, that flexibility, both from a technical perspective and also from a content perspective, is really critical when you're trying to engage this hard to reach population. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all to our panelists today, um, Clint, Diana, and Anne Marie, for leading today's webinar. And I appreciate everyone's time in submitting the questions. Um, if you have any questions regarding today's webinar or want to follow up with any of our representatives from WellTalk, please don't hesitate to contact um, them offline. Um, you can certainly contact me directly, Nicole Dolan at ndolan at mhpa.org, and I'd be happy to put you in contact um, with the right representative from, from WellTalk as well. But um, thank you all for joining today's webinar and to our business associate member WellTalk and all of our presenters. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing all of this wonderful information. So without further ado, I will go ahead and end today's webinar. Thank you all so Great. much. Thanks so much Thank for you. having us. Thank you. Great. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone.